next lecture is still introduction. So this one's play tectonics. So uh, most people know play tectonics, but let's just make sure we have our nomenclature correct. So quick review of play tectonics, then remind ourselves that stress really drives the, the deformation. And we can usually associate the sources of stress with play tectonics. And then I'll have a quick summary of uh, Indonesia play tectonic setting and history and Indonesian act of fault. So this part that actually helped me with, and, and many of you may know more about this, but just review what we know so far. Okay? So first, the importance of play tectonics is the essential paradigm for understanding the significance of geologic structures. The plate interactions control how rocks are, are formed and what environments they're in and also the plate motions generate the stresses that drive deformation. And so this, uh, there's many cartoons or movies we can see of the plates moving over geologic time, and we also see the general pattern of flow where we have, you know, creation of oceanic crust at divergent margins, destruction, cat conversion, and we have horizontal motion and transform system. So we know if you just so the power of plate tectonics is explaining these distributions, right? So most volcanoes can be explained by their position relative to plate boundaries. So you see the big arc here, where that's why there's so many volcanoes here, right? Above the subduction zone. That's the explanation. The observation is that they're in an arc. Same with uh, much of the Western Pacific, but also East Pacific, more distributed, you know, East, Western North America is more complex. It was once a convergent margin, then it became a transform margin, and this kind of distributed deformation and distributed volcanism over the last 10 million years. Then also earthquakes. So this was one of the fundamental pieces of evidence for plate tectonics was where the earthquakes were. And so we see these observations. And we start to say, okay, so there's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and here's the subduction boundary uh, with their seismicity. And then we can now, with the technology, the last 20 or 30 years, really actually measure the motion of the plate. So this was first done with very long baseline interferometry, so taking uh, apparently planar wavefront from a like a pulsar in the galaxy and looking at the change in arrival time across the Earth. And if you can measure time well enough, you can see that the time of arrival changes because of plate motion. But now we mostly use GPS. Right? So global positioning system is really a revolutionary tool for measuring absolute plate motion. So we know the motion relative to the center of the Earth. So we'll talk more about GPS and geodesy uh, day after tomorrow, but this just shows generally the motions you see, um, you know, Europe kind of moving away from North America because of the spreading of um, the Atlantic, but we see these high convergences across the Australian plate against the Eurasian plate, which Sunda is the edge of, right? And Sunda is really not just sitting there, it's actually trying to get out of the way, but it's going to the southeast. So these, well, no wonder the deformation is complex. It may help to explain like the Great Sumatran Fault. So then, of course, over longer time scale, we see the development of the mountain belts. And so this just shows the young mountain belts of the world, and they're associated with plate boundaries, so the dark brown young mountains. Geologically. So this was the model Earth's major plate, and uh, it's you know sort of North American centric. So here we are over here on this side. So we're really looking at the interaction between the India Australian plate and the Eurasian plate when we talk about uh, Southeast Asia, and also then going to Pacific and Philippine plate. So complex plate interaction. So this was this grand unifying theory that you know, it took more or less 50 years of the 20th century to develop, starting in the early 20th century with Alfred Wegener, he said, okay, it looks like the plates are, are drifting, but he couldn't see under the ocean. So, and then it took 
to World War II and navigation, basically navies, they were looking for submarines, so they started dragging magnetometers along and they could see the magnetic stripes of the seafloor and started to uh, be evidence for motion of the seafloor and then also seismological observations were critical into the 1960s. So the fundamental boundary type, the kind of horizontal motion, parallel, uh, so like transform system and then divergent and convergent. So then also when I showed this already before, but the global seismic hazard map is basically following play boundaries. So obvious maybe, but there are however some you know continental interior settings like here, especially in uh, kind of mostly in China, where we have many active faults that are in the continental interior. So we start to wonder, are we talking about kind of microplates uh, because of the localization of deformation on these continental interior structures? Or how do we describe the behavior of the continent there? But much of these other high hazard zones are on well-known plate boundaries. So I showed this one before, superstition plate boundary strain. So when we talk about what makes the plate tectonics work, there's it's mostly a balance of forces, right? So we have uh, basically some kind of resisting forces here, which are the R's, and then the S are the driving forces. So you know the always this was really interesting to me to think, well, how do plate tectonics work? And so but there are forces that are driving it, and the biggest ones are the ridge push. So this is the ridges are high and they push down, but also out. And then the slab pull, this negative, well, this the slab is falling down and also it's uh, being kind of pushed or pulling down. So the ridge push and then the slab is, is falling into the upper mantle and, and being sucked down. And so that gets the place the kind of the divergent to convergence system going, but then all these resisting forces of overriding plate resistance, for example, there's mantle drag, there can be uh, the ridge resistance. These basically fight against those driving stresses, and so it's that gent that's kind of critical balance between the forces that give us the complex motion of the plates on the Earth sphere. But it's these forces then that put stress on the fault. That make them move, right? So we talk about these stress regimes or fault regimes in the lithosphere, and this comes from uh, and what when I talk about this in a structural geology class, we say Andersonian faulting theory. So the idea for Andersonian was that the principle the stresses are you can divide into principal stresses. So there is basically the the maximum horizontal stress, minimum horizontal stress, and a vertical stress, and those permutate between the absolute principal stresses, which are sigma one, two, and three, where sigma one will be the maximum compression. And so we know we can identify those those principal stresses. And in Andersonian theory, they're either parallel or perpendicular to the tree surface. They're not oblique. And so for this reason, when we have fault surfaces, that are like these checkers here. The fault slip is always uh, in the direction of maximum resolved shear stress. And so that tends to give us either dip slip or strike slip fault. There's not too many oblique slips for this reason because the Earth's free surface doesn't allow for much shear. Just the wind blows on the surface or water blows on it, drags on it. But that's the only significant shear stress on the Earth's surface. So there has to only really be vertical normal stress on the Earth's surface. So that means that the rest of the stress tensor has to be rotated to be parallel or perpendicular to it. And so we can identify these regimes of normal stress and thrust depending on where the maximum compression is. Almost always the vertical stress is gravity, the weight of the rock. And so when we're in a normal fault regime, the weight of the rock is greater than the horizontal stresses, which may still be compressive, but that allows the crust to pull apart if it's weak enough. Whereas in the thrust faulting case, the horizontal stresses are larger than that vertical 
stress the weight of the rock, and so we, we shorten things. And then strikes is kind of a special case because the vertical stress is somewhere between the maximum and minimum stress. So probably you know all this, but critical, this is how we think about fault in a simplified sense. So then we can look at stress and even try to measure it. So this is really now fairly well established, but it's kind of revolutionary because you can't see stress, you know, it's just force over some area, right? Whereas you can see motion, but we think that force is what makes things move. So this I've showed already, the sources of tectonic stress, it's a different look at the, you know, basically like the kind of pushing of the slab down and then pulling of it versus you know, the resisting stress and the overriding plate. And there's these kind of local tectonic stress due to mountain ranges or sedimentary basins that load loads across. So any one of these sources of tectonic stress can drive us. So here's the world stress map, and it's a little hard to see in this slide. It's a project that the Germans are heading up now in <clears throat> mostly in Heidelberg, but uh, what they do is they compile all information about stress. And so many of these come from um, petroleum from wells, because if you drill a well, you have a weakness in the crust, and that well will will start to fail and crack on, on one side. And that's the, the, the breakout is on the, uh, um, if you're pushing sigma one here, this would be in the opposite to that direction. But also, if we do hydraulic fracturing, so we they call reservoir stimulation, you can take a well, you can close two ends of it off, and you can pump hot, uh, high pressure fluids in, and you can crack the rock. And so these hydrofracks always go in the direction of the maximum horizontal stress because they open the easiest way, which is the direction of sigma three. So so these kinds of borehole observations are one main source, and that on here is the mostly like, it's kind of hard to see, but that's breakout, drilling induced fracturing, borehole slaughter, over coring, hydrofrac. These are all sources of information about stress from wells. And so you can see that a lot of that comes from, from petroleum rich regions. But then there's other information like we think focal mechanism, uh, the, you know, sort of first motion away from a source, seismic source when you're far enough away, may tell us something about the stress state. And so we can use focal mechanisms to infer maximum and minimum stress orientation. And then the other ones is we have some assumptions about fold. So say if you have a fold, it implies contraction this direction. If you, you make a fold like this, then that would be the direction of maximum horizontal compression perpendicular to the fold. So they show this one down here, geologic indicators. So we get directions, but they also try to get relative magnitudes, and so we get these regimes. The red is normal faulty, green is strike slip, and blue is thrust. And so they just put these on a map and let's see what happens. So I'll zoom around. So here's North America, and we, we can see a couple of important things. First one is here in this higher topography part of the uh, like where I live, where Geyser lives right now, it's, it's extending a little bit. So it wants to pull apart. So it's sort of a normal faulting stress case. But then right on the plate boundary where the San Andreas is, we see blue, which is strike slip, and green, which is thrust slip. So a mixed kind of stress state, and that's exactly the kind of fault that we see. Then in the continental interior, so in the eastern North America, you see it's, it's mostly black, uh, which is not well defined, but it's some combination of also green and blue. There's almost no red here. So it's mostly horizontal compression, reversing strikes with conditions. And what you can see is it's really coherent orientation. And so the, what's always been really surprising to me is, you know, out here is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And these directions are pointing at the mid-Atlantic ridge. So it's kind of proof that ridge push really works. It affects the stress state. And they're, they're feeling the push of the mid-Atlantic ridge 
all the way into the middle of North America. And so then when we have earthquakes like this one that occurred last year in Virginia, it was a reverse faulting, basically north-south striking earthquake. So it was exactly as predicted with this kind of orientation and proper fault fail. So now coming to Southeast Asia, there's actually lots of data and it's very complex. We see actually um, Sumatra, for example, is kind of combination of sort of unknown, some extension parallel to the arc, uh, but then some extension, there's a lot of extension parallel to the arc, some strike slip here in Java, some reverse faulting Madura, um, uh, lots of strike slip reverse around this side of the Sunda system. You see Tibet, lots of kind of extension, but also some thrusting. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult to you sort of uniquely interpret these data, but they, they kind of paint a picture of what is going on right now and what kinds of faults expect to see. And so this, uh, I always like to show the stress map because it's a reminder of, of what's driving everything. And also the messiness of the reality that it's not always so simple. And the fact that topography in some places is important. So Tibet, as well as uh, Western North America, the topographic stresses are significant enough because of high topography that they dominate the stress. So we get extension system there. So any questions about world stress now? Okay. So now coming to just a little summary of Indonesian uh, tectonic setting, and you guys can help if I don't say something quite right. So what's interesting to me is that uh, when I first started learning about this part of the world, I, I thought that it was really dominated by oceanic lithosphere. But really, Sundaland, or the tail of, of Eurasia, is dominantly continental lithosphere. But the edge of it has had a lot of material attached to it over time, and it's been extended a little bit. And so the colors here show this kind of steady growth of the region or, or kind of the, the margin. And this growth is partially by addition, but partially by, by some stretching. So the land is not all kind of uniform lithosphere. It's pulled apart a little bit over time, but also added to. And so these, especially these yellow zones have been added, and the gray shows pieces of trapped oceanic crust. So we know we're adding continental fragments and oceanic fragments as we build the margin. So this makes for very heterogeneous material, and so no wonder it's a complex tectonic setting. And so here is that tectonic setting where we have Indo-Eurasia convergence at seven millimeters per year, basically perpendicular to the arc in Java, which makes for, I think, special kind of upper plate conditions, but this obliquity, that is, there is obliquity, so the Indo-Eurasia plates move in the same direction when we get up here, but the trench has turned. And so this uh, angular difference uh, between the motion of the incoming plate and the plate boundary then allows for this partitioning between the subduction and the shearing in the back, in the arc, which is the Great Sumatra Fault. And then on, on this side, it's quite a bit more complicated with multiple uh, slabs interacting and rapid changes in direction and magnitude of convergence. So here's a seismicity map that shows uh, basically depths of earthquakes. The reds are shallow and then the orange would be deeper. So uh, we can see um, kind of zonation of these, these different places by the polygon and um, kind of shown discussed this already, but this this area east of Java has this complex suturing going on and very uh, sort of rich deformation pattern that's not quite as coherent. So, you know, we don't have the simple coherent subduction zone or simple coherent threats of faulting Great Sumatran 
default, but instead we have much more complex and rapid changes. And so then this shows seismicity a little bit more carefully, and the colors really help us see where the slabs are. So the blue is deep, 300 to 700 kilometers. So, so we can see where these slabs have gone down into the upper mantle, and they're still deforming, giving off uh, seismic energy. And especially where we can see red to green to blue, we see the, the actual dip of the slab. So very clear definition of the slab coming down underneath Java, right here, right underneath us. And then a kind of a steepening of the slab by the time we get over here uh, near Flores and the collision zone with Papua, and then very complex zone of basically uh, westward directed subduction in this region. So then this is an early view, and I think Katsuli is in here on the right there. Yes, right. How do you say? Katsuli. So he was thinking about these problems early on, so 1970. So this is you know, he's hearing about plate tectonics at the time, and he's starting to think, you know, big picture, and so he starts to put these faults together. And so you can see he already has a sense that this part of Sunda is kind of pooling out to the southeast, um, and then he knows where the big faults are on land. But he hadn't quite picked out the the subduction system, right? He does have limbum faults, so right behind us, he was probably because we live here, right? So that's interesting, I think. So then, okay, let's jump to the future, or, you know, to closer to the present. So Bach et al., this was a long effort by, by Bach and others um, here as well to document the motions of these blocks or microplates in this region. And so this was paper from 2003 where you can start to really see this convergence of the India-Australia plate going along, we see some transfer of this deformation across the subduction zone. So this is really strain accumulation right here. But then it's pretty quickly, once we get outside of the influence of the subduction zone, we see this very clear uh, southeastward motion of these blocks in, in Sunda. And then this kind of really interesting rotation around Banda, and then high convergence across Papua frontier. So this is, uh, you know, interesting that there, you know, as you guys know, in Papua, you know, there are oceanic, uh, like, corals that are five kilometers high, right, and they're only one or two million years old, so it's going straight up. So this deformation has been ongoing at a rapid rate for geologic time scales. So there's so as we start to kind of characterize the deformation of the region, we start to take it apart into pieces because these pieces then are are uh, what we might expect as uh, sources of earthquakes. So remember when I started talking about the earthquake ha seismic hazard assessment, the first thing we need is fault model. And so the, the first thing you do is identify the three-dimensionality of the fault, but you also break it up because we, we know that earthquakes don't go forever, they, they stop. And so usually we think of the stoppage as occurring at some geometric discontinuity on the fault zone. So if it's really smooth, it may keep going, but if it hits a band or a step, it may stop. So, or there's some kind of change in behavior. So this is a segmentation model for mostly the subduction system, where you see some upper plate structures although they're not really as, uh, they're not delineated as segmented. This is mostly just the subduction pieces. But then here you can see the magnitudes that are expected, which is really just coming from the area of each of these. And then a little bit of uh, anticipated kind of Gutenberg-Richter uh, value based on seismicity around, in the volume around it. So then here's the, a little bit more of the, okay, the last was the subduction zone. Here's the non-subduction sort of upper plate, mostly faults. And so we see pretty clear segmentation of 
grade two modern fault, and then some effort to delineate the active fault from Java, and these other ones here, below AZ, and so on into Papua. So one of the, the kind of really inspiring projects that here, and you guys have a nice poster on the wall, and also Dan Hillman, his work for his PhD was to map the great Sumatran fault, right? And this was hard work because in these settings, there's lots of vegetation, active geomorphology, and also volcanoes covering the fault. So uh, this is why it's really admirable to see the basic observations of the fault system from one end to the other. So it's a long project, right? I think it took about 10 years to get this done from when they started until the papers were coming out. And um, so you can see it's not a perfect, well, you see the system. So we have the subduction interface here and this tilted, right? Um, and the four arc, and then this discontinuous and not perfectly straight Great Sumatran Fault. And, uh, you know, so many results came from this, including the fact that it didn't seem like the volcanoes were strongly controlled by the, the fault. Because you might think, okay, well, where the fault, could, the volcanoes could control the fault, either one, it doesn't seem like they exactly uh, control each other. Um, and, and then also, this drove then some work to begin to make GPS observations in the region to look at the interaction between the strain accumulation along the production interface and then also strain accumulation in the arc itself on the Great Sumatran Fault. So, uh, very inspiring work and, and may uh, be a kind of a template for what, what we should do in other places in terms of really just mapping and compiling as much as possible. You know, this work, they used the 1 to 50,000 topographic maps and also many air photos. And now, if you know, although it's very expensive, we can use other remote sensing like LIDAR mapping. We'll talk about this, where some of this work could, you know, we could do uh, even more detailed mapping. So then coming to Java, we see we can, this I showed already, but we can really nicely see that uh, subduction interface as delineated by the seismicity. So um, under, you know, under us, we're, you know, 150 kilometers down to the top of the slab. And that generally, in that 150 to 200 is the, the depth at which we really start to get significant dewatering of the slab and melting of the mantle driving our volcanism. So in terms of seismic sources for Java, we've already mentioned this some, but we have the subduction zone itself. And then these, the upper plate deformation, including this transform zone, which comes through this area. But I guess there's still a lot of debate about exactly what what's going on and how coherent the transform system of, of Java may be. So um, here we see the six to seven millimeters a year subduction of 150 million year old ocean crust, which is pretty old. So that means it's going to be pretty heavy and negatively buoyant, so it should go down easily. Um, and then, so here's this transform zone. So Kimandiri, Limbang to Pati, Latin Fault. And, you know, I, my sense is that there's a lot more continuity of these structures and probably other ones, but they're all really low deformation rate. And so when we talk about geomorphology, if you don't have a very high tectonic signal and you have a really high geomorphic signal, you can't make tectonic landforms. They get destroyed too fast. And so, so this is the real challenge for Java, right? So that was uh, the, my lecture on site tectonics and active fault for, um, and with uh, some emphasis on Indonesia. So uh, we can maybe take a short break and we'll do the third one. Or are there questions or comments? Things you guys want to add for Indonesia? Yeah. 